from downtown Decatur. It's the Faber Files. Hello, I am your host, Bill Faber. Because democracy demands debate, we present this program of public issues and interests, conversations on television that are held nowhere else in our community. Tonight's special guest is Representative Sue Shearer, freshman representative in the Illinois legislature, and we're really glad to have Sue on our show to talk about the compelling issues that face our town and her district. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me, Bill. It's the first time we've had a chance to interview you. You're 10 months or so into the job. Yep, that's about where we're at now. Started in January. And you ran a heck of a campaign. Your opponent was Dennis Shackelford, a Republican from over in the Rochester area. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. I saw you in our neighborhood, and you were just wearing out your tennis shoes. Yeah, yeah. I continue to do that. It, it amazes me. I've worn my shoes out from the inside out. On the outside, they look like these nice pair of shoes, but inside they are just like flat like paper. There's, you know, a lot of walking. But I think that's what a representative should do, and you know what, I'm continuing to still do that. Mm -hmm. I was actually in your neighborhood a couple days ago, but didn't get as far as your block out in the West End. But um, I think as a representative, what you ought to do is you should go and hear what people's concerns are, what their ideas are, and people are busy, you know, they have their families, they have their jobs, they have their own lives, and they don't always have time to come to my office or call or whatever, but if I'm at their door, it just takes them a few minutes and it gives them an opportunity to give me ideas or, or maybe they have a concern they need to voice or a way they want me to vote. Or, you know, a lot of times I'll hear concerns that, that they maybe didn't know where else to turn and then we're able to help them with that. It's very unique. I remember the first time I saw you walking the West End, you reminded me of the time I saw Penny Severance. Uh, the late Penny Severns walking uh -huh. the same neighborhood getting the votes and she was so popular as you are now. Well there's funny stories about Penny Severns and I because I have had a lot of people tell me that I remind them of Penny Severns only taller <laughs> and then when I, I taught for 33 years um, before I did this and back when I was teaching fifth grade and we studied US history at the time and, and state history and we would go to the Capitol, and I actually met Penny Severin several times because um, she was a state senator, but she always took the time for, for my class. And she took us on the tour of the Capitol. She'd go out in front of the Capitol to get pictures. And I always thought, she is so busy, and she's not worried about her voters because these are just 10-year-olds, you know. But yet she took the time, and I still remember her staff are coming up to her saying, Penny, you're supposed to, you, we've got to go, you are late for, she's like, these kids are more important. And she stayed right there, and I have those pictures hanging in my office now. So yes. it's kind of neat to look back on that. She's sorely missed. Yes, but. she is. That's a great story. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Colored, President of the Senate, was mm -hmm. in town just the other day, and uh -huh. he was saying he was driving the Penny Senate's Memorial Highway, and right. he was saying it brought tears to his eyes as yeah. he remembered Penny as he drove here. Right. And so, I, I see that, and I think, wow, this is kind of sort of what she did. And yes. at the, when I met her, it never crossed my mind that I would ever do that job. Never. In my wildest imagination did I think I'd end up doing that. So 32 years as a school teacher, yep. attended St. James Grade School here in Decatur, mm -hmm. St. Teresa High School, yep. ISU University, and then a master's degree uh, at uh, Eastern Illinois University. Right, yep. So where did you find the courage to run for political office? Well, I've always been a gutsy person, I guess, but so that's kind of innate. My dad just sort of instilled that in us kids, but it actually started when when uh, we had a breakfast the last day of school, you know, after the last day that the kids were there, and some of us teachers were sitting around, and this is when they were redrawing the map, so I knew Adam Brown would be moving to a different district than that, and we said, you know what, we need average, everyday working people, regular people in there instead of politicians, and we think that's what's wrong. We don't have people with just common sense, average, everyday people in there. So, um, her name was Cassie Crouch, she was a co-teacher, and I she says, I think, I think I'm running. And I said, you know what, Cassie, you would be great. I am behind you, yes, I think you should do it. Well, by the end of the breakfast, she says, you know what, I'm not running. <laughs> what was I thinking? And in my mind, I thought, well, you know what? 
maybe we do need just average everyday people mm -hmm. in there with common sense. And so that's kind of where it began. Yes. And then it just so happens that Jim Underwood is the county Democrat chairman, and I taught his wife and his son, and so I knew Jim on a personal basis, and then it was about a month later that I ran into him out at the Futures Golf thing, actually. I said, Jim, I'm thinking about this. He's like, yeah, yeah, and he says, he says, are you serious? I said, well, I might be, but I just can't decide. He says, well, first thing I need to do is get your phone number. So we exchanged phone numbers, and then the whole summer I just kept in the back of my mind, my daughter's getting married, and I'm like, I'll put it off till after the wedding, and just kind of molded around in my head. So finally, the day school started, it was like, okay, I have got to make a decision. I can't put it off any longer. And I really wanted to have the decision made before Labor Day. So we decided to do it. <laughs> and it's really important to have an educator in the General Assembly because with uh, education in school such a priority in our culture and our society, right. we need people who know the game. And you know what, that's a part of this that I have really cherished and, and felt humbled to be able to serve in. And yet I feel like I bring a perspective that's usually not there. Mm -hmm. It's like they'll talk about ISAT or they'll talk about, you know, an education program. I'm like, wait, I, I've been there, I've done that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've given ISAT tests for 25 years. I can tell you what really happens in a classroom involving ISAT tests. So. Tell us what really happens. Well, what really happens is there is an extreme amount of pressure put on the teachers, the everybody in the school, all the way to the cooks and everything else. I mean, there's just an incredible amount of unnecessary pressure, if you ask me, because that doesn't bring out the best in people, or children especially. And I just think a lot of time is spent preparing for tests that could be better spent in other ways of, you know, just doing your everyday teaching of the important things that kids need to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your candidacy reminds me of the attitude that our founding fathers and mothers had, and that was that government service was, was a priority, was part of their responsibility as a citizen. Mm -hmm. And they didn't run from it, they served, maybe they didn't want to, they mm -hmm. traveled roads, dirt roads, they were on horseback, mm -hmm. but they realized to build a nation, to keep a democracy, the good people had to serve. Mm -hmm. And today the That's good people true. run from the responsibility. Yeah. That's very true because the things you say about riding on the dirt roads and that, and, you know, sometimes people see this whole image and it's like, that's not what it is at all. It's a lot of time spent, you know, eating out of a gas station, changing your clothes in the bathroom at McDonald's, you know, riding alone, going places alone, and, and having a lot of inner strength and courage to just you know, the number of times that I sit and eat a meal with total strangers. I was in down in Christian County um, just a couple days ago, and I walked in, and there was a whole table full of, of older people, and I just started talking, as I do, you know, when I go to the restaurants. And they said, well, are you just coming? Are you going to eat? Just sit and eat with us. So I sat down and had a very nice meal with, and then when I was leaving, I thought, you know, who would think that I would just walk in restaurants and eat a whole meal with total strangers? Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny to think that way, you know. But to me, I hope they didn't feel like I was a stranger. That if I'm representing them, then I'm not really a stranger. Then really, I'm their representative. So even if I haven't met them yet, then we will be friends when we meet. Because that's, you know, if you're representing people, that's how it ought to be. You know, uh, former Senator McCarthy, who served for many years in a banking uh -huh. committee, he, he, he always remarked that he really enjoyed campaigning. The opportunity to get out there and really meet the people, he said they were just delightful. Uh huh. And so kind. And, oh my goodness, the kindness of strangers. You just wouldn't believe. You know, you come to someone's door, oh, you look awful hot, you better come in and cool down. Here, let me give you some water, or, you know, and. Actually, anything, you wouldn't believe, sometimes I need to bring a backpack with me. People have given me the most random things. You wouldn't <laughs> believe it. I've been given a cross that a guy made, a nativity set, uh, just random things. Mm -hmm. You know, a bottle of water or whatever. And, and it's just the kindness of strangers. But, you know, when I'm at their door, sometimes you get the feeling that you're like kindred spirits, mm -hmm. even though you really never knew each other before. Yes. You know, there's so much in the media uh, that seeks to divide 
the people of our country and of our mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have so much in common. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I spoke the other day at the Rotary Club in Decatur. And a lot of people, I think, before I spoke, felt like, well, she doesn't believe anything I believe. But it's just exactly the way I started it is. I bet everybody in this room shares a common belief, and that is that we want the best for our community. We want it to start where we're at now, and we want it to get better every day. When we get up, we want today to be a better day in our community than it was yesterday. And, and that's what we need to build on. And we may not all agree on how to get to better, but at the end of the day, we're all working as hard as we can to get to better. And yes. if we work together, we can get things accomplished. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a, good, that's a good attitude. You've been in the job 10 months. Yeah. So how does the reality compare with your image of it? Uh, how does the dream compare to the reality? Oh, well... Everything that I thought would be very hard has become very easy, and everything that I thought would be easy is very hard. How's that? And I know it sounds silly, but I remember laying awake at night thinking, oh my goodness, what if I really get elected, and I'm going to have to sit in that big chair and push that button, and those decisions, and, and it's going to be so intimidating, and as a woman especially, and, and then I thought, that would just be so hard, you know. And then I thought that, some of the other things would be so easy, like, you know, just talking to strangers and that, that kind of comes easy to me. Well, some of, some of the easiest things I do is push that button, because by the time I push the button, I've totally made up my mind before I walk in there to the floor of what decision I'm going to make. So when it comes time to push the button, that's, that's just the easy physical part to it, you know. Um, and then the hard part has ended up being hearing all these horribly sad situations. I don't want to cry about this, and I won't, but it just breaks my heart sometimes when I see the need, and I'm like, I can't fix everything. You know, I can't save the world, but I want to. Yeah. So. You can only do what you can do. That's right. right. A little bit That's at a right. time. A little bit at a time. So I started out thinking I was going to fix the whole district. Mm -hmm. And now I'm already down to, and in just 10 months now I realize, and I told my staff this yesterday when we were walking in a really um, poor neighborhood in Springfield, and I said, look, we are going to change this district, and we're going to do it one block at a mm -hmm. time. There you go. And we are. We're going to do it one block at a time. Because you can't just change the whole city of Decatur. You can't change the whole east side of Springfield or all the little towns between. You, you can't do it all at once. So one block at a time you can make a difference. So we're talking to an audience this evening as they're watching your interview and hearing your, your comments on government mm -hmm. and your personal uh, journey. What, what suggestions or advice or requests do you have of the citizens of your district, Sue? Well, my first request is when I come to your door, please answer the door <laughs> so that I can actually meet you, find out your concerns, you know, hear what you think I'm doing right or what you think I'm doing wrong, how I might change it. That's one thing that really helps. And I know sometimes people are kind of scared, and it seems kind of hokey sometimes that I always wear my little white polo shirt with my name on it, but I do it on purpose. Because I know if someone came to the door and I was ready to recognize that, I would be more willing to open the sure. door than a, just a stranger in, you know, whatever clothes. So that's my purpose of that. And the other thing is when, you know, I really want them to share with me truthfully how they feel, what they think I can do different to make things better. And another thing, and this goes back, so much that I do goes back to what I learned in teaching, but I remember our good principals would always say, look, if you come to us, please come and tell us about any problem before I hear it from someone else. And then please also give me a suggestion on how to solve it. And so that's what I would like from, from people at their doors. Not only what's the problem, which I hear all the time is jobs, the budget, you know, education, but also what idea do you have? that might work, because you'd be surprised. Sure. That's where I get my ideas from, mm -hmm. people at doors. Wow, yes, yes. 
What about jobs? I know when you, when you were campaigning, that was an important issue that you were champion. Mm -hmm. uh, what is what is your plan and what's going on in terms of producing jobs for the Decatur community, which is the highest unemployment rate right. in Illinois? Yeah, it's something that we're not proud of. But I'll tell you something that that has actually helped is when Senator Menard and I have worked hand in hand so much recently. And when we go to try to get things at the state, it does help our cause somewhat. So we use that trigger as a, to our advantage, but um, some of the things that we've done so far is we had a job fair. It was down at the KC Hall downtown. We had almost 700 people come. We had over 50 employers there, and um, I spent the whole day, again, you know, I just kind of am learning on the fly, but when I walked in, I spent the whole day just trying to match the people trying to get a job with with an employer that they might be well suited to. And I was asking both both sides if they had any ideas of what else we can do, what's a missing link to put all this together. We're getting ready to have a job boot camp coming up. Let's see, I've got it in my notes, so I'll find the exact details. It's Friday, October 18th, and it's from 9 in the morning until 12.30, and it's here at the Public Library in Decatur. So that's October 18th in the morning. And that's a, what we're going to do at the boot camp is people will learn, um, we might help them write resumes, give them ideas of how to put their strengths on their resume, how to do a good search on the internet, some skills of how to put your best foot forward at an interview. So my thought was, okay, we did the job fair, and then we've got people wanting to actually land the job. What's the missing piece in the middle? So I'm hoping this boot camp is, it's not a job fair, but I'm hoping that it can help people get propelled to the next step, and I would recommend that they, they bring their, their skill sets in their head of what they can do and maybe even bring a resume they already have and we can look and see. We're going to have a whole group of people working with us to try to help people with that. I'd like to talk about the committees you're serving on the legislature, okay. but before I do, I want to ask you this, this about this compelling topic. Uh, the Decatur School District is searching for a new superintendent. Okay, yeah. We have 18% minority uh, uh -huh. in, in our community. 50% uh -huh. of the students are minority students. Mm -hmm. What advice or suggestions or recommendations do you have for the incoming superintendent once they're named? Well, I... I see that statistic and that just kind of blows me away. I just That just seems so, and I remember years ago teaching and they said there's going to be a day when this is what your statistic will be and we need to have our education system geared towards that and that day now I'm living to see that happen. Um, so what, what I feel needs to be done is the superintendent that we hire needs to be a person with compassion and understanding and one that doesn't say, oh well, it's just too big of a problem, we can't fix it. As I said, I, I'm hoping to help indicate one neighborhood at a time. I'm hoping that this superintendent tries to help one classroom at a time and um, can bring the best out in our teachers. I know there are wonderful teachers in Decatur Public Schools. My kids have gone to several different public schools in Decatur and I actually started teaching there and then ended up getting a full-time job in Morella. But um, I see a lot of good things in Decatur, and I hope that this superintendent that they bring in has their heart here also, and that they're looking for the same thing, that they understand the needs of all children and do whatever they can to make that happen. In terms of your service in the legislature, now what, mm -hmm. what, what uh, committees has the, has the speaker appointed you to? Well, I've, I've been on several committees, but actually the two or three main ones that really meet a lot and, and are more substantive, I guess, agriculture was one that I requested. You know, living here in a community that um, we have a lot of agriculture here and we have businesses tied to agriculture. Um, another one is higher education. I wanted elementary education, but I could not get in on that, so I, they just weren't going to give me any education at all, so I practically begged and pleaded, and they just still wouldn't, and I begged and pleaded some more, and so finally they called back and said, okay, we can squeeze you into higher ed. So um, I really enjoy that because I feel a little more knowledgeable on that, 
and then I try to share my expertise with others. And one of the areas I feel more knowledgeable on it, not, you know, not that I've taught college a lot, but something else that I've done in, in my journey is I've taught um, college classes. I've taught teachers going back to get their master's or hours past their master's um, as an adjunct professor. So I feel like I kind of have seen it from that side and then putting four kids through college, you know, we saw it from the other side. So of course the funding is a big deal and um, I had student, I didn't have student loans as a kid, but I had grants, you know, because we weren't from a rich family and I would have never been able to go to school if it hadn't been mm -hmm. for grants and working my way through. And they jokingly say, yeah, and you lived on tomato soup and I did, yeah. you know. My dad went to college to the GI Bill. Right. Thousands of veterans in, after World War II in Korea had that, 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 uh, that funding. Right, mm -hmm. right. And thank goodness that's still in place for a lot of people. Sure. And I can see nowadays something that I would really like to encourage people to think about if they haven't already is having their children do this dual credit in high school. I, I really pushed that with my own kids and I just <laughs> wouldn't pretty much didn't give them a choice. It's like, you've got to do that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if after that you're going to go to Richland or if after that you're going to go to a four-year school. It transfers right in. And you get to be one of the first to register for your classes. And then you can take a little lighter load as you're getting used to college. And I, I think it makes them a lot more successful. Sure. You know, I was talking with an educator just yesterday, and they were saying that 75% of the students who matriculate to Richland College are in need of remedial help. Yeah, that's frightening, isn't it? That's very frightening. And we can do better. I have my own plan on this, and that is one thing that I've enjoyed about this job. And I've told other teachers, I said, all this stuff that teachers are always thinking and feeling, and it never gets mm -hmm. taken any further than the teacher's lounge. And now I feel like I actually am having a chance to say it. Yes. And on the behalf of, of not just myself, but most teachers, I bet you if you surveyed every teacher in the city of Decatur and said what one thing could make a difference, I bet you'd get the same answer almost every time. Which is? Small class size. Small class size. Small class size. I swear on a stack of Bibles, I think this could be, I think it could be a, a change, game changer for our whole city. What size because is that? Because when I say small, I mean small. I'm talking like 12 to 14. And I know people are thinking, oh yeah, how can we afford that? How can we afford not that? Mm -hmm. Look what's happening in our town. How can we afford not to sure. take that chance and try it? So, you know, with that in mind, whatever money they're spending on anything else, quit spending it mm -hmm. and use all that money and pour it into class size. You know, as you know, Sue, the great history of, the great lesson of history is that the power of the idea is, is so much stronger than the sword. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we spend much on military, right. but as we look forward to the future of our nation, what could be more important than an educated, sophisticated, talented uh, workforce and leadership? Right. And when you think about what does small class size do, I strongly believe in teachers. And I believe in, in my heart of hearts, they're some of the most compassionate, caring, wanting to help people that exist on the face of the earth. So you put them in a classroom and you say, here, I'm, all I have for you is a blackboard, some chalk, and some books, paper, and pencil, mm -hmm. and I'm guaranteed it will get results. Get the job done. Forget about all the fancy everything else, mm -hmm. but make it small enough that if a child needs special help, they have time to give sure. them special help. If, if there are kids that are not getting along, there's enough room in the classroom to put them on other sides and teach them how to make friends over here and over there instead of having them all, you know, it, it, crammed into one small spot with one teacher who's just trying to really stay on top of the discipline sure. a lot of the times because there's so many of them. And you know some kids come from homes for whatever reason it might be that the parents can't do a good parenting job. So you put a teacher in a classroom with a small class size, she can help that parent. She can do for that child what the parent isn't doing. But you can't do that when you have 30, 35 kids in a room. It's just humanly impossible. Sure, sure. I just don't get the great criticism that's long launched upon teachers in our society. I, I just don't quite understand it. It would seem to me that teachers are far more important than, say, stockbrokers. Right. 
Well, and I think it goes back to pay historically. You know, if you make a lot of money, then your position is valued. And if you don't, you mm -hmm. don't. Well, the first year I got out of school and I was like, I got a college degree. I'm going to go buy a new car, la, la, la. And I walked in and the salesman was all ready to go on it. And then he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a teacher. And he said, oh, well, we have some mopeds out back. We'll, we'll go around and sure. look at them. And I thought he was joking. Mm -hmm. And he was dead serious. Yeah, there we are. So, you know, that tells you something there. Yeah. So, Sher, thank you for being on the Faber Files this evening. It's great to have you here, and we look forward to your dynamic leadership in the days to come. Well, thank you. Appreciate being here, Bill.